So by the time you get to that point of the change, which is the conclusion of the argument where you're like, well, if you want this and this is the problem and you believe this is true, then this is what needs to happen. Absolutely. Like, you know, to done it right when they're like, okay, great. But how? Like once they're asking how they've already decided and at some level, and now it's only yours to lose at that point by not giving them the detail that they're looking for. Welcome to the Simple Brand Podcast, the show dedicated to helping you create simple experiences for your customers and for your team members. Each week, we're bringing you amazing interviews with business leaders and authors who will teach you how to differentiate your business with the one thing your customers need the most, simplicity. Your customers live in a complex world. Let's make it simple. Now, here's your host, Matt Lyles. Have you ever had a big idea and you were trying to get others to believe in and to buy into that idea? I mean, I've been there before and it can be frustrating knowing how great your idea is, how much potential your idea has, and then recognizing that the people you're trying to convince just aren't getting it. And then it can be frustrating when we see it come so naturally so easy to others who have the talent or who have the gift of having people quickly and easily buy into their ideas. Like, wow, how does she do that? How does she immediately get her message resonating with others? How does she instantly get people buying into her ideas? Maybe she's born with it, or maybe it's Maybelline. (laughs) But what if it didn't have to hang on you having a knack for it or having a talent for it? What if there was a process you could follow to help get people to not only understand your idea and have it resonate with them, but for them to actually buy into your idea as well? It turns out there is a process for that, a pretty powerful process. And it's taught by this week's guest, Tamson Webster, part strategist, part storyteller, part English-to-English translator. Tamson Webster helps experts drive action with their ideas. Tamson honed her trademark red thread approach in and for major organizations like Johnson & Johnson, Harvard Medical School, and Intel, as well as with hundreds of individual founders, academics, and thought leaders. She's also served for over eight years as the executive producer and idea strategist for one of the oldest TEDx events in the world. So I'd say she knows a thing or two about how to inspire and engage audiences. And... Tamson's the author of the best-selling book, Find Your Red Thread, Make Your Big Ideas Irresistible. Tamson and I discuss her lessons and her process for taking your big ideas and making them irresistible to any audience. And it turns out that the key to doing this is by building the story that your audience will tell themselves about your idea. Okay, I was super intrigued when I first heard that statement, and I hope you're intrigued too. Because now that I understand what it means, and now that I understand Tamson's process, I'm totally bought in. And this is the same step-by-step process that Tamson's taught to hundreds of clients to help create memorable presentations, keynotes, marketing campaigns, TED Talks, pitches, and more. And once you learn this process, you'll be able to win over, inspire, and influence your audience every single time. So here it is. Here's my interview with Tamson Webster. Hi, Tamson. How are you? Welcome to the show. Oh, I'm so good, Matt. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm excited to finally be able to talk to you about Find Your Red Thread. Yay. And wait, correct me if I'm wrong. Aren't you close to the one-year anniversary of the release? I, what, yes, May 17 was its one-year birthday. It's a whole year old. It almost walks. Yeah, that, there you go. <laughs> it's pulling up. There you go. <laughs> it said its first words. <laughs> it's it, well, you know, in in one year, I think it's doing a lot to help a lot of people, and and it's it's actually helping me in my own business as well. So I have. Oh, loved, I love that. Yeah, I've loved hearing about it over the past, you know, couple of years. Your lessons all around it, but then like to actually get it in that one book and be able to really dig into it. Oh my goodness, so much fun. Oh, super. Well, that's that's why I did it. Whoever wanted it could just have it all in one place and have a little Tamsin in their pocket. There you go. Pocket Tamsin. Love it. Well, 
And the idea of the lessons around there and making your ideas resonate, those are great. But first, I want to talk about the actual term, the red thread first. And I want to take it back all the way to Greek mythology. So can you talk to me about Greek mythology and how that gives us the term, the red thread? Well, absolutely. And I should note, as I as I try always to do, that there's a red thread in almost every religion and philosophy. And so I don't want to you know, underplay the fact that it exists very much in non-Western philosophies as well. But the this red thread and the way that it's used in idiom, and particularly in European countries, does seem to come from the Greek mythology. And the Greek myth that, that's in play here the legend is of Theseus, who is the son of the king of Athens. And he was the one that defeated the Minotaur in its labyrinth. And the way that he did that was, well, A, Ariadne helped him (laughs) because B, she gave him a sword with which to kill the Minotaur, but she also gave him a skein of red thread so he could trace his path through the maze so that he could find his way back out again. And so that idea of something that allows you to find your way got turned into an idiom that refers to the red thread, the thing that connects things, the thing that makes things make sense. And since in my work, you know, I felt like that was what I was helping people do. And the myth really described process itself of having someone retrace the steps of how they came up with an idea. It just seemed like the perfect name for this process and its output. Well, and I think that it speaks to the fact that a lot of times when we're trying to win somebody over with our ideas, you know, whether we're pitching to investors, whether we're writing a screenplay, writing a book, giving a talk or a keynote, whatever it is, to use your term, we can't just slay the dragon. Right. We've also got to show them the way and help them find their way through the maze. Absolutely. I mean, our intentions are generally always good when we're trying to get our ideas out there and our, and our marketing out there. But essentially, we, you know, when we say to someone, hey, you have a problem, you should buy my thing, it solves the problem. It's kind of like saying, hey, you have a monster? Well, you just need to slay the monster. And they're like, okay, great. <laughs> I went, ow. Because, you know, your method of how Actually, that's, yes, people want what your idea can give them, but the thing that will make them act on it, and in fact, the thing that will make it irresistible to them is if the how they need to do that really aligns with how they see the world. And that, I think, is an underappreciated aspect of how people make decisions. Yeah. And and that goes back to what you talk about around, it's all around the story that they tell themselves and being able to align to that. Yes. I mean, we all do it. I mean, I recently ran across the statistic that 60% of purchases at Ikea are unplanned, (laughs) which is hysterical. That's actually pretty high. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, and that's a lot, right? Like the majority of things that you buy at Ikea were not things that you walked into Ikea planning to buy. And, but at the same time, we still walk out with them. So there's something that we're doing in that moment that allows us to go, well, this makes sense. I totally need that. Or this would help us do whatever. And the moment you do that and you don't even do it consciously, that's your brain generating a story to make an action that some other part of your brain has already gone, do it, do it, do it, do it. And you know, the more rational part of your brain is like, let me just create an explanation for you. Um, So the whole thesis of the book is because people are going to do that anyway, why don't we supply that story for them, right? Rather than having them try to like figure out what ours is, figure out how their own rationalization matches up with ours. Well, why don't we just figure out what their rationalization, what their justification for our idea would be and use that and start there because it's more work perhaps for you, but it's a lot less work for them, which means it's a lot more likely that they are going to actually act. And that's the goal. That's the goal. That's right. (laughs) Simplicity is my love language, of course. And so that's what makes it simple for them. You prevent them from having to go through all those mental hurdles, trying to figure out, trying to rationalize it, trying to make that connection. And you just do all that work for them. Exactly. And it really relies on not trying to convince them. It's about really saying, much like when you walk into Ikea and you're like, 
I need that pillow because it would fit in my living room. Yeah. You want them to have the same kind of reaction to your idea. They're like, oh, I need that idea because it fits in with my life, the way I live it, the things that I'm doing now. You know, obviously this applies to organizations as well. But yeah, we're just trying to make it as easy and as simple as possible for them. Yeah. Well, and we've mentioned this a few times, story, telling the story, yes. storytelling. And I think a lot of people are talking about storytelling today that we've been talking about for a few years, but I think it's gotten to the point where a lot of people are misusing the term storytelling. They'll say storytelling and it's kind of like um, Inigo Montoya from Princess of Brian is like, <laughs> <laughs> you, you keep, keep saying word, storytelling, but I don't think it means what you think it means. So I'd yeah. love to understand from you, when it comes to storytelling, where do you see people doing storytelling wrong? Oh, well, we could just talk about this for hours, Matt, because this is like, oh, do tell. this is like my bugbear. The thing that's really got my interest, curiosity, it may even be like topic of my next book is the fact that I think storytelling has been hijacked by heroes. And, and what I mean by that is that we are overusing a single style of storytelling, namely the hero's journey, the quest, the monomyth goes all, you know, the kind of classic Star Wars thing okay. as a stand in for every kind of story. So a lot of business storytelling advice, not all, but a vast majority of it is about, well, just tell a hero's journey, just figure out how to make your customer the hero, how put yourself in whatever role seems right. And there, boom, you've got a story. Sometimes that works, but there's more than one kind of story. And that was part of what was in my head when I wrote and started research and then wrote The Red Thread in the first place, because I was trying to help people get the benefits of story. And at the time, I was helping people who, A, didn't consider themselves to be natural storytellers. So this was, you know, this all started with my work with TEDx Cambridge. And so these were academics and right. technologists and engineers. These are people who are like, I don't want to tell a story. <laughs> they're like, I don't want to tell a story about myself. I, like they're just very uncomfortable with it. And the second thing is that the ideas they were talking about, the problems that their ideas solved were not problems of generally of individuals and individual psychology. These are large, oftentimes societal challenges that are complex and nuanced and sophisticated. And you can have a, a single hero's journey story can be simple, you know, nuanced and sophisticated, but the hero's journey can't tell that very inflected kind of societal level story. It's kind of the difference between Star Wars and Game of Thrones right? Star right. Wars is very much a hero's journey. It's about Luke and it's about the forces of good and evil. And it really comes down to Luke's individual choices and his individual psychology. And then Game of Thrones, well, who's the hero of Game of Thrones? There <sighs> isn't one, right? And so, and because at Game of Thrones, and there's other things that fall in this category, The Wire, which is a great TV series, Wally, oh, wow. the movie also counts as one of these, where there isn't a villain. And there isn't really a hero because these are stories about systems and about how individuals react to systems. So I know this is a big old long thing, but that's what I think one of the biggest things that people get wrong with stories is that they use one type of story in a place where it's not appropriate, right? Like it doesn't fit. It doesn't, it's not going to serve them as well as a different kind of story. And so that's why when I was building the red thread in the first place, my, my approach to it, I was looking not at the hero's journey. I was looking at what are the elements that all stories have so that those elements, whether you needed to tell an individual hero's journey kind of story, or you needed to tell a much more scalable story, a systems story, a societal sociological story, right. that the approach would still be simple and useful for both. So there you go. There's my thesis of my next book. <laughs> There you go. Oh, wow. Exciting. Well, yeah. and, and so that kind of takes the fact that there's all these different structures, different formats. And when you look at them and lay them down side by side, what I'm hearing you say is that they all still follow the same sort of model that you've defined with your model. Is that right? Yeah, storytelling is, I should say, a lot more complex than a lot of times it's represented to be because there's a lots of different kinds of stories, right? Because all of a sudden you yeah. start thinking about it and you're like, well, that's true. There is no villain in Wally. -E. Like it's the only Disney movie with no 
villain. <laughs> or or then you try and like force fit a villain. Well, maybe maybe yeah. this is the villain. And then it creates some big conflict right. in our head. Right, but it's it's not that, right? Like in Game of Thrones, while there are some good and not so good characters, you can always understand why someone did what they did, yeah. even if you wouldn't didn't necessarily agree with it, right? But there wasn't like out to get Tywin Lannister. Like he wasn't the villain. Ned Stark was killed off, spoiler alert, end of the first season. So it wasn't about him, right? Like, so the, the, you know, the villain in Game of Thrones was much more the corruptive nature of power, right? And that's really what the, that's kind of the might is right is the villain of Game of Thrones. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's the, all stories though have elements in them that drive the story forward, right? So, and this goes back to Aristotle and it goes back to his generally that there's three acts, you know, there's a setup, there's a conflict, there's a resolution. And I just found when I was looking at storytelling advice and I looked everywhere, I was looking at business storytelling and screenwriting and novel writing and all sorts of stuff. And nobody really told you like what was supposed to go in there. So where the red thread actually is, the points that it represents, so this goal, problem, truth, change, action that I talk about in the books are actually the kind of the start and end points of the act. Uh Because in order to start a setup, you have to start somewhere, which is where the goal comes in. What does somebody want? Do they not have? The pivot, you know, or as Blake Snyder calls it, the break into the second act, where all of a sudden you go from the setup into the dealing with the conflict is where the problem that the character, you know, or like the characters gets introduced that we didn't know about to begin with, right? That always happens. There is always a moment, right, where there is something revealed, which forces a choice amongst characters that determines like what they do. And that sets up the resolution, right? So that's the truth that I call it and the change, which is what they do. And then, then that all goes through some actions to get back to the goal and whether or not, you know, we got the ending that we were looking for. So because I went with what are the things that actually change and move the story forward, not what are the characters and what are they doing and what are the events that those characters go through? Yeah, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was creating a structure that actually supported both kinds of stories. But that's what, that was important to me because I was like, the hero's journey, I knew even when I was doing that work back then, like the hero's journey isn't the only kind of story. So how can I build a structure for people that can support any kind of story that they're trying to tell? And what's been fun about that is that I do a fair amount of work with uh, Dr. Nick Morgan of Public Words, and he's written a bunch of books on speech writing and all of this. And he bases his approach on kind of five story structures. So the quest, the hero's journey is one of them, but there's also rags to riches. There's also a revenge story. There's a love story. And then there is another one, which I'm not remembering at the moment, but we've done some work together. And what was fun to discover was that no matter which of his five story story types you use, my five pieces are present in all of them, which is like that, that was kind of validating to go, oh yeah, it does tell all sorts of stories. There you go. Yeah. Good, good validation. So it sounds like it's not so much the format of what characters go through in a story, but the areas, the gateways that a story must go through for yeah. the story itself to come to fruition. Correct. Exactly. That's exactly right. it, Mike. Yeah. I mean, because there's, I forget who said it. It might've been Robert McKee who said that that conflict is the engine of story. And it isn't just that one big conflict, but so there's, there's actually a series of conflicts and, and it's these series, these, these inflection points, right? It starts when there's a conflict because there's this something somebody wants and they don't have, that's a conflict, right? There's another conflict when all of a sudden there's a problem that's getting in the way of that goal that they didn't know about and they have to solve. That's a conflict. There's a conflict where they have to choose between the world as they knew it before and the world as it's going to be if they do something different. That's a conflict, right? And then the decision that they make, right? 
again, that is resolving the conflict. Then, and then at that point, you're in, then you're in the home stretch. So you said it so beautifully. I haven't heard it said that way, but that's exactly it. Is what are the elements that drive a story forward, regardless of the character, regardless of the content? Because ultimately, that's what I was trying to help these you know, these technical speakers at TEDx Cambridge yeah. do. Is like, how can I help people get the benefit of a story? The way our brains process them, the kind of built-in emotional arc that comes with them, the you know, and all that, without having them stand up and tell a story. And what I came to was, well, if we organize the information in this way, if we make sure that these elements that drive a story forward are present, then the information will feel like a story. It will have the benefit of the story. It will be processed by the audience's brain as a story, even if there's no actual once upon a time story told. So it makes it simple for our brains to track along with it because our brains recognize may not recognize oh wait where's the character where's the villain or but our brains recognize oh this is something that I'm familiar with I'll be able to easily track along with it that's right this is reason why the stories that we tell other people have those elements is because they are the elements that we need you know we need to know like why are we doing this? What's the goal, right? We need to know, okay, well, why is, why is that so hard? Like, why are we not getting it right now? And they, and we need to know, okay, if I'm going to do something different, like, why would that make sense based on what I value, believe, just trust to be true about the world? Oh, okay. So that's why that person did this, or that's why I need to do this, or that's why this thing operates this way. And so therefore, I need to do this, you know, in order to get that, or this is what needs to happen in order for us to get that. It was kind of fun to test that. And it's been even more fun over the last six years now to just go, well, look, it works. <laughs> and each time being able to get that, to get that validation, oh, it still works. No matter what, it still works. no matter what situation, no matter what idea still works. Yeah. I mean, cause Think about it like we're discovering that the analogy of our brains being computers is increasingly outdated, but if you'll, you know, Extend me the grace of using it. Sure. You, story is like a code language for our brains. It's like JavaScript or, you know, something like that. But it's programming language, right? And so what happens when you put your information in the structure of a story, when you make sure that you've got all the elements of a story in what you present to people, you are essentially uploading your idea straight into the story processors of your audience's brain because their brains just go, oh, I know what to do with this. And they go, and so what happens is you're able to transfer that information to them with as little friction as possible and with as little distortion as possible because they're not having to fill in the blanks themselves. They're not having, you know, their brains aren't trying to like go, oh, wait, okay, I understand the beginning and the end, but I'm not quite sure what happened in between, Um, which is by the way, where most marketing and most messaging, most communications fails. Because, you know, think about it. If we just said with Star Wars, well, you know, once upon a time, there's a bratty kid named Luke who ended up saving the galaxy. Okay. <laughs> you're like, great. But a lot of our marketing is the same thing. Where <laughs> just this, yep. There's this ad for eHarmony that I show in one of my keynotes where the script is literally, you know, this guy's with, with a dog and he's like, this guy's my best friend. That's what I want in a partner. That's why I trust eHarmony. What? So I'm missing in the middle, yeah. right? And it doesn't so compute. Like, it doesn't compute. And so this is what, you know, that's what that particular talk is about. It's like, you have to make sure you have all the parts because if you don't have all the parts, then somebody is either just going to go, well, that doesn't make sense. So I'm going to ignore that. Or they could insert something that isn't what you intended and come away with a completely wrong in understanding of it. Or, and this is what's critical, when you kind of surface that thing that is so often unstated, someone can go, ah, Yes, that's exactly why I do this thing. And, you know, it's exactly why I am so crazy brand loyal to this ridiculous brand of jeans <laughs> that I wear. Raleigh Denim Workshop in, uh, uh, in or Denim Supply. I always get it wrong. At Raleigh, North Carolina. And oh, wow. Because the story, I mean, it's real. It's what they do, but they've like, they've rescued all these denim and jeans making machines from when North Carolina used to be like the place where Levi's, like everybody had their denim made in North Carolina before it was shipped off overseas. And so now like that's their whole shtick is 
and their whole, and it's not a shtick. It's, it's like truly who they are. They're like, they right. really believe in like small manufacturing and like rescue, you know, like saving these things so that, I mean, the last time I ordered a pair of jeans from them, I got this email afterwards was like, you just struck a blow against mass manufacturing. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, yeah, <laughs> you know, that just made me a gushed on American hero there. It's amazing. Wow. And that was a good way of being able to fit you into the story as well. That's right. So in that case, you know, that's an example of where the hero's journey is appropriate, right? Because right. they have cast me as the hero of helping strike a blow against, you know, mass manufacturing. You know, I do a lot of work, actually, the vast majority of my work is with impact startups. So in clean energy space, mobility, smart cities, regenerative agriculture. And so these are big problems that these folks are solving, right? And I, you know, I, one of my clients was solving the split incentive problem with real estate. And you might be saying, what the heck is the split incentive problem? Well, the split incentive problem with real estate is what happens is that a, like a building owner will retrofit their building to be more energy efficient. And the tenants, that that cost doesn't get passed to the tenants, right? So that that's a split incentive, right? So uh. there's, no incentive to the owner to actually do it because they don't make the money back. And so, you know, I was working with them on how to message their solution, which is that they actually created a financial instrument, which was essentially a lease on the energy efficiency that tenants were getting. But there's no villain there, right? There's no right. hero. Like there's no like, and it would be the height of arrogance for a company to say, like, we are the hero that we are going to solve the, you know, the split incentive problem, oh, like, or even solve the difficulties of energy efficiency and retrofitting in real estate. I mean, no, but, you know, similar thing happens with nonprofits where I spent 15 years of my career. Like, there's not oftentimes an actual villain. Like, you know, I wanted to be an art museum director. Is there a villain? There's no villain. There's no villain. So how do you tell the story of an art museum and why it exists without a villain? Well, because if you take it to these kind of larger concepts and constraints about connections with history, like, you know, current events versus history or patterns and cycles, I don't know. Like there's all sorts of things where you can say, okay, well, given these tensions that exist in the world and because we believe X, we, this nonprofit, exists, you know, this is why this is our mission. And I think you can even start to hear that when you make that kind of articulation, it's not just, you know, a lot of times nonprofits will state their mission out loud and just hope people connect with it. But a mission is really an internal document. It's just kind of a, it's just kind of making sure that you know what you're doing. But right. when you explain why your mission is what it is, that's what people actually connect to. And that's true for nonprofits or anybody, anybody else. But that goes back to this idea of story because the story that created your organization, your idea or whatever, you know, it may or may not resonate with somebody else, like as like, oh, I'm going to adopt that story too. But if you tell it as the story, they'll at least understand and be able to make a much better, more informed decision. And for those who, with whom it does align, you're much, much more likely to make a really solid, strong both rational and emotional connection. And those are the strongest ones of all. Absolutely. We've talked about it at a high level. You mentioned some of the elements, but I'd love to dive in and walk through your model itself now. Can we talk yes. about that? Sure. Yes. So there's five major elements uh, right. that I talk about. Like each one gets a chapter. I mean, there's a, there's a sixth one that gets a chapter. It's basically going back to the beginning. So I don't count it. <laughs> so it's happening. So any message, any story that we tell ourselves and any story that we tell other people starts with what I call the goal, which is the establishing what somebody wants or what we want as a society and don't yet have. Or I'm just going to make an individual right now, but it's, it's, it can be bigger than that. And the easiest way for you know an individual organization to find that is to say to themselves, what question is our audience asking for which our idea, our product or service, our organization is an answer? Like, so what is something that they're asking right now? Is it, how can we improve profitability? How can we solve this split incentive problem? It's, you know, how can we uh, make sure our, we're spending our investments in, in wildfire prevention wisely? These are just questions that people are asking. The second element is the problem that stands in the way. And this is fairly nuanced, but generally what this is, is a tension uh, between two things. And it's not like, hey, audience, you're doing the wrong thing. It's, hey, the thing that you're doing is the product of one particular force 
But there's another force, right, is kind of sitting on the other side of that that could be equally valid, right? So we're trying to find this two-part problem, this tension between how the audience is currently looking at something and how they could be looking at it. The third element uh, is the truth, which is essentially a deeply held value of belief that makes that problem of perspective impossible for your audience to ignore. Because if they do, it's going to put what they want, their goal, in jeopardy. So it's the goal, problem, truth. Uh, that truth, because it makes that problem possible to ignore, it forces a choice. And so that fourth piece is the change. It's what is that choice that someone has made? So for an organization, that's often what is the change they represent in the marketplace? And then the last piece, the actions are what are the things that, what are the actions, the steps, the process, the components that someone or the world can take to make that change real? And that all brings us back to the goal. So I call that the goal revisited, where the kind of even though we generally find it in a linear format, it actually operates in a circle um, right. because that's how our brains know a story is over because we can ask, did that person or did we get what we were looking for? Did we get an answer? And once we know we've gotten an answer to that original question, then we know the story's over. There you go. Yeah. So we said the goal was this. Now we're here is the goal achieved or do we have right. what we yeah. know to be the achievement of the goal? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Does this change? Will this change give us the goal? Do we believe that making this change will get us the goal? And if we've made that case, then someone will go, oh, great. Yes, let's do that. And then and then their brain will start to look for the next story, which is where the goal revisited comes in. Because you can say, hey, not only did it get you this you know, answer that you're looking for, it also gets you all these other things as well. It kind of paints the picture of what's possible, I like to say. There you go. Did you know that in addition to my podcast and my articles, I speak to audiences all over to help them simplify their customer experience and simplify their employee experience? I've spent the last few years leading a crusade of simplicity across the globe. If you want a winning brand, you have to provide a simple experience to your customers and to your team members. Whether it's a live event or a virtual event, I'd love to partner with you and teach your audience how to do just that. With over a decade in marketing, I know how to hook and captivate an audience. And as a speaker, I know how to connect with the audience. Along with my lessons, I use stories and humor to keep everyone engaged and inspired. Then they leave with the knowledge and next steps to transform their business. As an event planner, you're managing lots of details to give your audience the most memorable event. The last thing you need is a speaker who will make your event memorable for all the wrong reasons. Not only will I leave your audience energized and inspired, I'll make it easy for your team to work with me. Hey, if I've built my brand around simplicity, then you know I'm going to make it simple for you. When you visit mattliles.com slash speaking, You'll find everything you need to know, including details on my topics, promotional materials, and most importantly, a link to connect with my team so we can book your event. So visit mattliles.com slash speaking. I can't wait to help your audience brand out from the crowd. I'd love to dive into each of those a little bit deeper, sure. if you don't mind. So let's, let's go back to the goal and the, uh, the, goal the goal statement. And when I was thinking about this or when I was reading about it, I kept thinking about, okay, so is it their goal or is it something else like what I want there to be their goal? But really, if, if I understand correctly, it's all around knowing what your audience, what they want, what they really, really it's want. Their goal. Yeah. yeah. The simplest way to think of it is it's their goal, not you. What you wish their goal was. It's not what you know that deep down they actually want. It's actually, it's what they are actually saying they want right now. And if that's wrong in your mind, then that's your message number one is to get them to understand that they need to be asking, to get them to a change of asking a different question. But yeah, the goal is their goal. And so generally a way to think about it is the most effective goals are either an urgent issue that they need to solve. So an urgent issue can be, you know, there's been some kind of urgent event that happens, uh, but it can also be there's a there's a legislative change or there is a pandemic or there is you know something like that where all of a sudden they're like, oh, crap, I got to solve this right now. 
there's the great resignation. How do I keep my employees from leaving? Yes. Um, it's like the they ask you answer question. Like, what are they searching Google? 100%. It's love, Marcus Sheridan. Yeah. Yes. It's very much, what are they asking? What's your answer? But in between is making sure that you've got the case for it because someone can hear your answer and go, okay. <laughs> I mean, how many of us and in a pursuit of getting healthier, we already know what the answers are. Like, have we always followed that advice? No. Right. So, you know, that's why it's like just having the answer isn't enough. You actually need that connective tissue. You need that story that people will tell themselves about it. So one of the things I recommend actually just last week in my newsletter was really a three-step process. Like first, list out all the questions that you think the audience is asking. Second, cross out any for which your idea, product, service, organization is not actually an answer. Right. And then which of the ones that are left, you know, cross out anything that is not an urgent issue or a persistent irritant for them and that they would agree is one of those two things. And then you'll generally be left with a couple. Um, so choose the one then, that the one that just, that is more exciting to you to be the one like, yeah, we exist to answer that question. Like that's, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. And then that takes us to the problem then, right? Yes. So when it comes to a problem, what if you know what the problem is, but your audience doesn't want to buy into that, what if the audience doesn't believe you that here's the problem? Okay, so that's the whole point. It's you, you, you need to structure a problem that they will agree without convincing is something that's getting in the way, right? So an example I use in the book, one of my clients, you are sure they make tests uh, that tell doctors whether or not patients oh. are taking particular medications. Right. And so the goal question for them was how can we keep patients on these critical medications longer? And so the problem pair, remember, it's always a two-part problem, was that right now doctors have to rely on what patients tell them about whether or not they're taking the medication. So they're basically an interview with a the patient. They're like, hey, patient, are you taking the taking this medication? And the patient's like, yes, I am. And they probably are. They think they're telling the truth. But the issue with these medications that your sure works with in particular are that people don't feel the effects of the medication, but they also don't feel the effects of the condition that they're suffering from either. So for instance, HIV, cholesterol, you don't feel that you have either of those things, nor do you feel any different when you take the medications for them. So it's very easy for a patient to be like, mm, did I take that? I'm not sure. And then what we're contrasting that with, because it starts to open the door to what your sure does is that they have to focus more on what patients recall than on what tests reveal. Now, doctors know that that's an issue right now, right? But they don't really, because the tests that existed before you were sure are all blood tests and those results don't come until a couple of days after the patient's out of the office and potentially off their medication again. Right. So by definition, we kind of say, hey, you know what? We want to keep people on medication longer, but even though like there's a lot of other things they're getting in the way, you know, the, the real challenge is that we have to rely, wouldn't you agree, doctors, on what patients recall more than on what tests reveal? And they'd be like, well, yes, that's true. Okay, and then now we're going to go to the next piece of it, right? And so that's what we were trying to get people to talk about. So, you know, for instance, I have a client who, you know, she's working with folks on, she's a leadership coach, and she's working with folks on how to take more risks. And we created a problem pair where she said, you know, that, Oftentimes we are more worried about whether or not people will approve of what we're doing than whether or not, whether or not a particular action will actually improve us. So this kind of tension between approve, improve. And frankly, that's the work of finding the problem pairs that you're looking for a way to describe what you see as the barrier in a way that the audience would go, yes, I agree, that's true. And I don't feel bad about it, right? Like that's the thing. We don't want our audience to feel that's dumb. Funny stupid, incapable, wrong, because that closes down that story processing. It closes down. They're like, oh, well, this isn't about me because I'm the hero of my own story and I don't make mistakes. It's kind of what our brain tells us. Um, so yeah, that's the second piece. We're really trying to find that tension between those two things. Did that answer your question? I just want to make sure. 
Yes. Yeah. No, that did. And then you also took it a step further to like to remind, like you still got to present it in a way that doesn't make them feel negatively because when someone feels negatively, like that makes them more prone to want to push back. No, I'm not. Stupid. Yes. hundred percent. Yeah. It's the psychological term for it is reactance, right? They, they right. don't feel in control anymore. And so they're going to do what they need to do to grab that control back. And the easiest thing to do is to say no and to push it back. I mean, one of our Deepest needs as humans is, you know, is a is to kind of preserve our self identity. And for most people, that self identity is that they that we're smart, capable, and good. I mean, eighty five percent of us think that we're above average, which is funny, of course, <laughs> because that can't be true. And so, anytime that that belief is threatened, right, we're going to turn around and we're going to say, "Well, I'm not the not smart one, right? Like you are. You're yeah. you're the one that's not smart." And so, we have to be super careful of that. Uh, Because the story that somebody will tell themselves that will support a long-term change of action, which is what all of this in my mind is about, you won't continue to do something that is based in your having been wrong. Like you will not do it over time. Like you, maybe you'll try something do, you know, different or start something different because you felt that you were wrong. But unless you change the story around that to be, this is the right thing, you won't continue to do something. So we, we cannot base forward movement for someone in a negative. It's certainly not about right. them. Yeah. All right. Moving on to the truth. How do you make it where this problem is impossible for your audience to ignore? So you, you anchor it in a belief they already have or likely have about themselves or about how the world works. Because... As I say in the book, when two truths fight, only one wins. And so essentially what you're doing is you're pulling something up that is kind of essentially making a bet that this is a foundational belief they have about the world. And because they believe that thing, it will make it impossible for them to ignore that new piece of the problem you've given them, that kind of second part, without putting what they want in jeopardy. You know, so, you know, I use an example of De Beers Diamonds in the book. So because the the, yep. the De Beers Diamond tagline in 1947 is the best truth statement that everybody already knows. A diamond is forever. Because if the goal of the audience that they were talking to, and not De Beers' goal, but the audience's goal was to find, let's say, the best symbol of their commitment, particularly if they're heteronormative couple in 1947, then the problem, as far as De Beers was concerned, that people were focused on the ring, kind of the unbroken circle of metal, which, by the way, is a perfectly good symbol of forever, a circle with no beginning and no end. Right. And it was perfectly fine as a symbol until 1947. But as far as De Beers was concerned- Correct. Right. So they wanted people to focus not just on the ring, but the kind of ring. Do you see? So that's a that's a tension. That's that two part problem. Like you've been focusing on a ring. Yes. Have you been paying attention to the kind of ring? Well, why would I? Right. Like that's kind of like the the next piece. And so when when they introduced that tagline in 1947, drafted by a female copywriter, by the way, which like girl power, a diamond is forever. Notice how it doesn't, they don't say a diamond ring means forever. That wasn't the tagline. It was a diamond is forever, which for most people, they were like, well, that's a true statement, right? Yeah. Like it's very difficult to destroy a diamond. It's one of the hardest surfaces on the planet. You know, back in 1947, I'm not sure how much people knew about whether or not you actually could destroy a diamond. So when they said a diamond is forever, people are like, well, that is literally true. But in the context of the story that they were telling themselves, it became metaphorically true as well, right? So that if I want the best symbol, okay, and I have only been focusing on the ring, not the kind of ring, but I believe a diamond is forever. Well, now it makes it impossible for me to ignore that kind of ring because it means I can't have the best symbol because I am only have one forever symbol, right? But if I do put a diamond on it, now I've got a forever ring with a forever diamond. We're like doubling down on forever, babe, and we are in it for the long haul. And that led to the change, right? That next piece, which was to see the stone as the symbol, not just the ring. So the stone now is what carries so much of the weight, you know, or at least did for for a number of years of the meaning of, of that particular symbol, at least for a certain subset of society. Yeah, and then- Goal achieved. That's right. But you can grab anything from one of these things. So one of my clients makes carbon negative building materials. 
They actually make building materials that absorb carbon, which is important because a lot of the things that builders make generate carbon, right? So if they're trying to reach net zero carbon emissions goals, because, and this is the true statement that we use, to reach, to get to zero, every negative, every positive needs a negative. Right, right. That's just the way the world works, right? Like nobody's going to argue that if you've got two things and you need to get to know things, then you need to have minus two things, right? And so that's how we did that. We were like, okay, if you want to get to net zero, right? You know, there's there's that tension between positive and negative, but every negative needs every positive needs a negative just generally. So that's why we create negative emissions materials so that you can reach your carbon net carbon goal. So that truth is always some belief, right? My your sure one is relies on seeing as believing, right? So that's why they create urine tests, right? So that people can see the results of the test right in the office and they don't have to re- rely just on what patients recall. There you go. All right. So you mentioned the change and I want to focus on something about the change that this really hit home to me because I'm a parent. We talked about this earlier. I'm a parent of two boys and you wrote, when you give your audience a choice to not do what you want them to do, they're more likely to change the way you want them to. And as I think about it as a parent, I'm like, wow, okay, like I, I need to like reevaluate how I'm telling my boys what to do. But talk to me about the importance of choice. How does that help? Well, it goes back to one of those things we were talking about earlier, that reactance, right? When you set up something where you're telling somebody, well, the only thing that you can do to get that thing that you want is this. Well, then you've just removed that control um, that triggers that push back, grab back my control in any way possible um, reaction from them. So, you know, one of the things, one of the underlying tenets of the whole book is that you can't create change. You can only create the conditions for it. And so by setting up that goal, that problem and the truth, you are creating the optimum environment, right, for them to reach the, the same conclusion that you did. But you need to be able to say to them, but maybe I've gotten one of those things wrong. Maybe you don't actually want that because you need to offer that. You can say, because at the moment you get to the change, remember the truth exists because it puts what somebody wants, the goal in jeopardy, if they ignore the problem. So anytime that you've presented that truth, you're giving the audience an opportunity to either decide that they don't believe that thing that you have just told them, right? So they're like, well, that's not really forever, that diamond, as most engineers will tell me, or kind of classic example of a, of a truth revealed in the second Star Wars movie when Darth Vader says to Luke, I am your father. And what's Luke's first reaction is like, no. <laughs> so like you can choose that, right? Or you can choose not to want the thing that you want which is also unlikely, right? So that's why we can, to me, the red thread is set up to be optimal conditions because if you've based it in something that you know somebody wants and is very unlikely to unwant and that you kind of anchored a new perspective in something that they believe and are very unlikely to unbelieve, right? Like to get to zero, every positive needs negative. They're very likely to unbelieve that. Well, then what's left is, you know, of the three, the thing that people are most likely to shift, which is the perspective that they take on it. Because generally people want to be considered open-minded. I mean, this may not be true of our like younger children, but for adults, that's generally the case. They're like, well, you know, and if you've presented them with a new perspective that they're likely to take anyway, then it's a lot easier for them to do. So the kind of magic phrase that I, I use comes from my good friend, Phil Jones, who wrote a great book called Exactly What to Say, which is this might not be for you or some version of that where you're saying right. this may not be for you. Like if you don't want this thing, fine. Like if, if you don't believe that, fine. If that's not actually, if you're not troubled by the tension in the problem pair, fine. Like, and you have to mean that. And you have to say, listen, because if somebody doesn't agree with those statements, they are not your audience. Do you see what I'm saying? Like if they don't want that, if they don't agree that that tension, if they don't agree with that basic belief about the world, you are never going to sell that person anyway. So let them go. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I think they feel much stronger in having that they being the audience feels much stronger in having that, that sense of agency about it. Yeah. Yes. 100%. 
All right, bringing it on home, the Bring action. <laughs> How yes. do we show our audience the right way on the right actions to take? So I think really the actions for most folks are the easiest ones because those are usually the things that we figured out first. They're like the steps that you need to take or they're the components that need to be in place or they're the criteria, the descriptors that you'll know like when you've been successful or something like that. So generally when I'm working with clients on figuring out their red thread, like it's, it, it ends up being like, this is like the easy part. <laughs> and so, you know, the way that you choose which of those kinds of actions to go with is really dependent on what's the context for the message in the first place. So let's say like you've put this message on your, on your homepage. Well, the actions that you're probably going to describe there are what does working with you look like? What does that process look like? Um, it might be the different kind of products or offerings that you have, which would also consider it as actions. It might be how to get started or move forward in the process. That's another set of actions. So it's really dependent on what the audience needs from you. What are the details they need about the change in order to feel like they have all the information they need to know whether or not they would be successful? Because that's really what the actions are about. Like I, I say in the book, the details are what make the conceptual concrete. And so you want to think through, again, from the eyes of the, of the audience member or from you know customer, client, whatever it might be, what would they need to know specifically, right, in order to feel confident in making this change? Yeah. And it feels like, or it seems like to me that if you've done all the right work, in navigating through all these other elements, at this point, the audience is likely saying, okay, yep, I'm bought in. Now what? What do I need to do? That's exactly right. Yeah, because if ultimately every story is an argument, they've, they've said that in the pantheon of storytelling for forever and ever. What I came to realize recently is that that's actually literally true, that these elements that I've described in a story create what Aristotle called a syllogism. They, they create a basic argument where two premises are laid out. And if both premises are true, then you reach a conclusion. So it's kind of like all dogs are animals. That animal is a dog. Therefore, walnut, the dog is an animal. And a story is very much the same thing, right? It's, it's about, you know, it's about an argument for saying that in Star Wars is an argument for being a force of good in the face of evil. You know, and, you know to Raleigh Denim Supply is an argument right. for, you know, striking a blow against soulless mass manufacturing with jeans. And it, it's, it's literally true, right? That, that argument is literally true. So by the time you get to that point of the change, which is the conclusion of the argument where you're like, yeah. well, if you want this and this is the problem and you believe this is true, then this is what needs to happen. Absolutely. Like, you know, it done it, you've done it right when they're like, okay, great. But how? Like once they're yeah. asking how they've already decided and at some level, and now, now it, it's only yours to lose at that point yeah. by not giving them the detail that they're looking for. That's it. Yeah. Um, you know, and like, uh, Grant Baldwin speaker lab. Yeah. He says, you know, and I, I say this, this, this relates to more than just speaking, but he says, when you're speaking to an audience, you've got to be answering the questions. So what? And now what? And so when I look at these elements, it seems like the first few elements answer the question of so what, then the change in the action answer, now what? Yeah, I think that's a fair way to say it. it. Yep. All yeah. right. Well, so we started out, you know, talking about uh, understanding storytelling, uh, how people are doing it wrong, the need for these elements. We walked through the elements. So I think goal achieved here. Yay, I hope so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it brings us back. Like, how, you know, and once you understand, right, like the stories that we can tell other people, you often find that you have a much better understanding of, of your own red thread and why you do what you do the way that you do it. And that's a very powerful piece of knowledge to have. Absolutely. And even myself, like going throughout my day, like I'll be driving, you know, going to either pick up my kids from Taekwondo or something. And I'll just start thinking through like one of these elements and saying, okay, let me just make sure I've got this right with my business. Okay. I'm thinking through this. So it's been so fun applying these to my own business, but I've got one last question for you. Uh, if you were to create a five song soundtrack for find your red thread, what songs would you include? Okay. I had so much fun thinking about this. So I think the clear, obvious one would be 
Simply Irresistible by Robert Palmer. Um, Because it's all about, you know, all of this whole thing is about making an idea irresistible to someone, making it so it's just, you know, essentially by the time you give them that change, it feels like a foregone conclusion. In order to get there, you'd probably need something like Knowing Me, Knowing You from ABBA, right? Um, You have to know yourself and your audience. So the lyrics of that are not quite as accurate as I would want them to be, but the the concept's right. Yeah. And the title at least. Uh, so that's two. Three, I would say, uh, would be In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel, because that's really what the approach is all about. How does your idea look oh. in the eyes of your audience? Yeah. Like, what nice. what does it look like to them? Like, how do you make it look as attractive as possible to them from their point of view, not yours? And that's the, that's the big thing. And then the two last ones are, I think, probably, A, one's going to be unusual, and one, probably people haven't ever heard of it before. But the, the next one... I would put on, because it's one of my favorite songs, period, is the song Move On from the musical Sunday in the Park with George by Stephen Sondheim. Okay. And there's a couple lines in that that are speak to my work overall. And one of those is in that song. One of the lyrics of that song is stop worrying if what you're doing is new. Let others make that decision. They usually do. Just keep moving on. Wow. So I, I love that nice. because it's like, yeah. you know, stop worrying about that. Like, just stop worrying about that. And then if they follow up, the lyrics follow up with anything you do, let it come from you and it will be new. So give us more to see. And that's very much what the Red Thread is all about. Understand who you are. What do you do? Let that come out and it'll be strong and different. And then the final one uh, suggested to me by my husband, which was a great suggestion uh, by one of my favorite brand out of the UK called Elbow. They have a song called New York Morning. And it's kind of an ode to New York, but one of the lines in it is that everybody owns the great ideas and there's a big one around the corner. Oh, wow. Love it. Isn't that great? So I was like, yeah, Uh, that's it. That's it. Those are my five. Fantastic soundtrack. And that really ties it all to the red thread. So thanks for playing along. Oh, it was so much fun. I'm glad you gave me advanced warning because I certainly wouldn't come up with those five on the spot. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you'd probably sing like, well, maybe there's there's red, red one, lady in red. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like what? But no, I really wanted things that spoke to either the the kind of mindset behind it or that, you know, some of the, the key tenets of it. But I just love that everybody owns the great ideas and it feels like yeah. there's a big one around the corner. I, I I need to go listen to that song right now. That's fantastic. All right, Tamson, I've learned a lot yeah. from you today, but where can we go to learn more? Uh, I am literally the only Tamsin Webster in the universe, as far as I know, at least. Uh, so they can find me find me anywhere you find people online. But uh, my website is the hub of all of that. It's where you can sign up for my newsletter, get early access to my big ideas. So yeah, my newsletter readers have been starting to hear about this kind of sociological storytelling hijacked by heroes thing, you know, for a couple of weeks now and early access to some of the stuff that I do, like workshops and masterminds and things like that. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Tamson Webster. So go and learn more from her at TamsonWebster.com. From her newsletter to her workshops to one-on-one coaching, you'll find lots of opportunities for Tamson to help you make your message irresistible. And do yourself a favor, get your copy of Find Your Red Thread. It's now available in all formats. The audiobook version was just released recently. So if you enjoyed hearing Tamsin today, then you'll love hearing her in the audiobook version. And if you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It's going to make it so much simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring Jeffrey Shaw. Jeffrey's a highly sought after keynote speaker. He's a LinkedIn learning instructor and a contributor for Entrepreneur Magazine. He's the founder of the Self Employed Business Institute, where he provides coaching and business training for self employed business owners. He's the host of the top ranked self employed podcast that's heard by over 30,000 listeners per month. And he's the author of the best selling book of the same name, The Self-Employed Life. When someone goes into creating a small business or becoming self-employed, one of the main reasons they do that is to have more control. Trust me, that's one of the reasons why I decided to do what I'm currently doing. Unfortunately, 
Too many self-employed business owners find out that the self-employed life can be like a never-ending roller coaster where they have even less control than before. Trust me, that's what's happened and sometimes continues to happen in my life today, too. Good news, Jeffrey helps self-employed business owners learn how to gain control of their business and their life by creating the environment for the results they want instead of an environment that completely goes off the rails. And much of that is through creating what Jeffrey refers to as the self-employed ecosystem. And honestly, even though they're designed for self-employed business owners, I think Jeffrey's lessons will help any busy leader learn how to get and keep their life on track. So go ahead and subscribe. You'll automatically get Jeffrey's episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Simple Brand Podcast. Want to make your listening experience simple and automatically receive each new episode? Visit our website, simplebrandpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. If you're finding value from the Simple Brand Podcast, leave us a rating or review. That helps us get the show to the ears of the people who need it most. Be sure to catch Matt right here next week. Same Matt time, same Matt channel. Until then, keep it simple.